When we think of pirates, we probably don't think of an organization more complicated than a few drunk guys in a leaky boat. If this was the truth, pirates wouldn't have become as successful as some of them were. The key to this success was a well-functioning governance and a practical hierarchy. This video is the first episode in a series where I will discuss and analyze pirate society, ranging from the various jobs aboard to the legal process and their culture. In this video we will go through the structural groundwork. First, allow me to clear out some things. This video mainly concerns Anglo-French pirates active in the Caribbean and Indian Ocean during the late 1600s and early 1700s, particularly from the period of 1713 to 1723. Every pirate crew is different based on their own experiences and circumstances, but this video applies as a general rule. Alright then, pirate organizations can be divided into three entities. The smallest one is a crew, meaning a collection of individuals sailing on one particular vessel. The second entity is a company, which applies to a collection of individuals operating under one single command structure. A pirate company often consisted of just one crew, and the words were often used interchangeably, but one group of pirates led by a single leader frequently used a multitude of vessels, which requires a clear distinction between the two. A company can hold one or more crews, but a crew cannot hold a company. To these scholarly definitions I'd like to add my own, which is coalition. A pirate coalition is a large organization consisting of several pirate companies that operate in the same area and share various customs. They lack a single leader, however. Examples of pirate coalitions are the Brethren of the Coast, the Flying Gang, and the unnamed pirate coalitions operating out of Madagascar in the 1690s and 1720s respectively. Before looking at the hierarchical structure of a pirate crew, we need to understand the two individual units that make up the crew. They are the voting crewmen and non-voting crewmen. We'll start out with the voting crewmen. This is your average pirate. He's very different from your average sailor. A sailor on a navy or merchant ship is an employee, meaning that he has been hired by the owners of the ship to work for a wage. Merchant ships and even navy ships were often owned collectively by a group of investors or shareholders who would split the profits of a trade or privateering voyage they had invested in. The shareholders were responsible for setting up the policy and goals of the ship they owned. Your average pirate or voting crewman was not employed. He didn't work for a wage because he wasn't hired. No one outside of the pirate crew owned the pirate ship, it was owned by the pirates. They were essentially the shareholders. They invested their own work and resources to create an effective enterprise and had a personal stake in its success. Like shareholders, they distributed the profits of the voyage, the plunder, amongst themselves. Because of this split ownership, every voting crewman had a voice in the political matters and affairs of the ship. They elected officers and decided on destination together, for example. Next up we have non-voting crewmen. They were members of the crew that did not have a right to voice their opinion on the matters and affairs of the crew. If they got paid, they only earned a measly sum. Non-voting crewmen typically encompass slaves, servants, people forced into pirate service, and juveniles because they're too young and stupid. Non-voting crewmen were essentially the second-class citizens aboard a pirate ship. To become a voting crewman you had to sign the Articles of Agreement. These were a set of rules that regarded the division of plunder, compensation and discipline, and is usually called the Pirate Code. With the structural units and the individuals making them up out of the way, we will look at the hierarchy. The pirate hierarchy can be structured into three parts based on the inherent authority of every part. The first part includes officers, which are men that always had authority over the rest of the crew. Officers who always vote in crewmen. The next part are roles with mixed authority, meaning that their authority over other crewmen was circumstantial. The last part includes the crewmen with no inherent or circumstantial authority over other crewmen. Pirates understood that they needed a leader, one who could represent the company and their interests and take the initiative when needed. This prime officer was the captain. The authority and exact duties of the captain differed immensely from crew to crew and the details were discussed in its own future video. But in general, the captain could do whatever he wanted, as long as the crew agreed with it. If he went against the interests of the crew, they would depose him, and like other sailors, voting pirates were always armed. The captain would heed the voice of a council or majority during civil affairs, but command dictatorial powers during battle. Next up we have lieutenants. These are officers appointed by the captain, not elected by the crew, to aid him in governing the ship. Now on to the part with circumstantial authority. Most of the roles in this part were what I call officer artisans. Artisans on a ship were crewmen trained in a specific craft. Officer artisans had authority over other crewmen within their own sphere of influence and expertise. For example, we have the gunner and the carpenter. The gunner needs help to maintain and fire the cannons, and he gets that help from regular crewmen. When they work with the cannons, he can boss them around as he pleases. 
When they aren't close to the cannons, however, he has no inherent authority over them. The most important role in this part was the sailing master, or just master. He was the navigator who managed all of the ship's maneuvering and movements. Functionally, he was the most important man on the ship, and in a lot of pirate codes he got the second highest pay. In most cases he would be a voting crewman, and an officer second only to the captain. Next in importance we have the very conflicting quartermaster. As a general rule he was an officer elected by the crew like the captain, but his authority varied greatly. If he had low authority, he served a purely a functional role as a disciplinarian and economic manager. If he had high authority he'd be an officer, and would serve as a mediator between the company and the captain. Finally we have the positions without constant or circumstantial authority. Artisans in this group include the ship's surgeon and helmsman amongst others, who received a higher pay than regular sailors, provided they had signed the articles and were voting crewmen. We also have assistants to the various officers and artisans, known as mates. For example we have the gunner's mate, surgeon's mate, etc. The average voting pirate would have done the typical sailing work and fighting. The harder duties such as pumping or carrying heavy stuff was delegated to non-voting crewmen, as long as they weren't artisans. The working crewmen on a pirate ship were typically divided into two work groups, called watches. The larboard watch and the starboard watch. Two of the most important officers under the captain would manage a watch each, typically the quartermaster and sailing master. The two watches rotated between working and relaxing in four hour long shifts. As a wrap up of the video, let's take a look at the whole structure of a pirate organization. The largest type of pirate organization is the coalition, which consists of several loosely connected companies. A company consists of one or more crews. A crew refers to the men commanding a single ship. A captain commands a crew or company. If the company includes several ships and crews, he might call himself Commodore. Helping him run the ship are his lieutenants. The quartermaster and sailing master primarily fulfill functional rules, but often possess a lot of authority and serve as officers. After that we have the officer artisans like the gunner, who only commands authority within his field of expertise. Then we have artisans, who have no special authority but get a higher pay than regular crewmen. And finally we have regular crewmen. An individual pirate is either a voting or non-voting crewman. A voting crewman has officially joined the company by signing their articles and should be viewed as a shareholder in the pirate enterprise. He gets paid a share of the plunder and the size of his share varies on his importance and he may also vote in the company's affairs and movements. Non-voting crewmen are usually forced into service and rarely get paid. They are usually skilled artisans who would otherwise not join the pirate company but are vital for the pirate activities. Let's look at a comment from last week. Daniel Ray says that he appreciates the slower pacing of the videos. Thank you for the response Daniel, I've based the slower pacing on critique from previous videos. Secondly, last week I took up the sad news of David Bailey passing away. The boy from Discord drew a picture in his tribute and it, it looks great. Finally, I have to give credits to Magonzales2104 for providing me with a prime source for this video, which he posted on one of the old videos a few months back. His comment was actually blocked by YouTube and I discovered it almost by accident. Mago has a YouTube channel of his own and I'll post a link in the description below if, if I remember it. That's it for today lads, I'm very excited to read your comments on this video. Cheers. The Golden Gunpowder YouTube channel.